Well, welcome everyone as we're uh, still having others gather um, here. I, as I put in the chat, uh, please feel free to uh, say hello in the chat. I see a couple people from, um, have already done so from here in Elkhart, Indiana, uh, Wadsworth, Ohio, Spokane, Washington, uh, Seattle and other places. So welcome to you all and welcome to this, the second uh, episode in a new webinar series, uh, Anabaptist Witness Dialogues, uh, which is a series by Anabaptist Witness Journal. I'm your host, Jamie Pitts. I'm here in Elkhart, Indiana, along the St. Joseph River, uh, which is also um, Potawatomi land, uh, part of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi um, territory. In today's webinar, we'll be talking with Randy Haluza DeLay and Randy Woodley. Uh, we've been talking before we got on here uh, about how we're going to distinguish among the Randys. I think I'll uh, try to just maybe say their full names, but um, uh, we've got the two Randys here. Uh, Randy or Randolph Haluza DeLay is a social scientist who was a faculty member at two Canadian universities. For 20 years, he was tenured in sociology, and his scholarship is focused on environmental justice and religious responses to the e to ecological crisis in the contemporary world. And his article, What Does Shalom Mean? Comparing Anabaptist and Indigenous Perspectives, appeared in our most recent issue, which you can find on our website and get in print. Randy Woodley was raised near Detroit, Michigan, and is a recognized Cherokee descendant by the United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma. Randy and his wife, Edith, co-sustain Alahe Indigenous Center for Earth Justice, Alahe Farm and Seeds in Yamhill, Oregon. And this word that I'm probably mispronouncing, Alahe, is a Cherokee Indian word meaning harmony. Together, uh, Randy and his wife, Edith, host a regenerative learning center, farm, and community that invests in people's lives, teaching them to love and care for the earth from a holistic indigenous worldview. Randy is the director of intercultural and indigenous studies and the distinguished professor of faith and culture at George Fox Evangelical Seminary. He's the author of several books, including Shalom in the Community of Creation and Indigenous Vision, and uh, most Recently, I believe, Decol Decolonizing Evangelicalism, an 1159 p.m. conversation, which he co-wrote with Bo Sanders, as well as uh, Living in Color, Embracing God's Passion for Ethnic Diversity. And uh, while you're on the Anabaptist Witness website looking at Aunt, uh, Randy Haluza DeLay's article, you can also look up an older article from 2016 uh, in which Anabaptist Witness book review editor Steve Heinrichs, who I see is um, here today, um, is uh, in conversation with Randy Woodley. So uh, I'm going to ask the two Randys here a couple questions and uh, allow them to expand. Uh, we'll spend probably around half an hour in this mode of interview. Um, and then we're hoping to hear from you what has stimulated your thoughts, what questions do you have for Randy and Randy? And the way you can ask those questions is by using the little Q&A box um, to the right of the chat. And if you have a question at any time in the, in the next 30 to 45 minutes, please type it in there. I will go through those questions. And when the interview portion is done, I will uh, ask uh, Randy and Randy those questions. So uh, let's get started then with the interview. The first question is for Randy Woodley. Um, Randy, you've written extensively on the theology of Shalom from an indigenous perspective. And I wonder if kind of in broad strokes, you can share your vision for Shalom theology and how it relates to indigenous communities and land. Thank you. So good to be here with you. Um, uh, hello to everyone attending. Thanks uh, for tuning in. Um, yeah, I, if, if you can say that there is a central theme of scripture, I think it's the Shalom. Um, as I understand it, it's, you know, from the beginning of Genesis and that 
that fine balance of everything. And then uh, the first 11 chapters, then as uh, the, the stories go, as the shalom is broken, uh, this harmony uh, way that, uh, um, that I think are the sort of original instructions by creator to all humanity to live by. Um, and then you have the laws that uh, the, the Shalom is very much connected to Sabbath and to um, Jubilee, of course. And you have the setting aside of a seventh of your land and uh, why so that the poor, or the needy, the wild animals, etc., can eat, don't glean the edges of your field. The same reasons if you leave a bunch of olives or a bunch of wheat or you know, uh, a bunch of grapes out there, just, just let them be, don't go back and get them because poor people need them. You know, there's these safety nets that are in place. And then you have the prophets calling people back to a way of justice and right living. Um, and then when Jesus comes on the scene, his kingdom, uh, which, you know, I know it's a controversial word and, and, and not the word that he used, but his uh, kingdom, if you want to use that word, is very much a shalom kingdom. And then the whole New Testament testifies to this way of living in which Jesus sort of um, reanimates the whole construct of shalom. And so um, uh, for me, this is all about everything that Jesus had to say. This is uh, the way that uh, people from um, other religions, uh, some things that they can agree on, and some people who are just indigenous peoples all over the world can agree on. So to me, it's the most sort of universal construct of a right way of living uh, that we've been given as human beings. And so to miss that is to miss everything uh, about what scripture has to say. Mm, thanks. So it's a really expansive vision that deeply rooted, not just in one or two references uh, in scripture, but you would see it as pervasive throughout the en entire uh, Old and New Testaments. Uh, and this is something that Anabaptist theologians have also talked about, of course, and uh, Randy, who's a delay, you've written some about the relationship between the kind of vision that Randy Woodley has just shared to Mennonite theologies of Shalom. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. What do you see as the connections there? So taking the, what I consider the Anabaptist charism or gift to the world or world Christianity, among those things we usually say is our peacemaking focus. Um, and so I wa originally wanted to reconceptualize what does it mean to make peace with all creation, which actually comes out of Colossians 1, that great Christological hymn right there. And it's you know the idea of making peace with all creation, with all of the creatures of creation is, is mentioned twice in there. It was done by Jesus, you know, by his death and his resurrection. What does it mean to make peace with all creation? So that was kind of the, the genesis of my thinking about, you know, what is this? And then um, I should say that I'm not a cradle Mennonite. In fact, I came to participate in Anabaptist fellowships because as I came to faith as a university student, some like three decades, four decades ago now, and I made a decision to follow Jesus, I saw the gospel message in a way consistent with a radical discipleship. Um, a radical faithful ship and, and central to my understanding in those early years was to take Jesus seriously when he said such things as, you know, love your enemy. And then that can't be done in the abstract. It has to be done in the practical. So um, how do we do that? And I was an American born there and moved to Canada around 30 years ago. And that was deeply troubling to love our enemies in, in the United States and even in Canada. It, it contests the way we think about things. And so that whole notion of contesting the most prevalent features of our society and our culture, I think is deeply part of Jesus's message and Chris, Christian discipleship. Um, for over well, for quite a long time, I, I worked in environmental education. I worked for MCC in a voluntary stint, and I worked in an indigenous community with MCC. Mennonite writing about Shalom is, is prevalent. Often we talk about peace, but as Perry Yoder tried to explain in his book, which I compared to Randy Woodley's book on Shalom and the Community of Creation, um, for Yoder, Shalom has multiple meanings. 
And it, in his book, he really has a strong socio-political assessment. So shalom means like that personal peace that we seek in fellowship with the creator. But it also means that relationship with other, other humans, other people. Um, the social structures of our time need to be analyzed. And shalom also means to be in integrity. Uh, so again, that good relationship with God, to be a person of God. And I'm a Christian because the Bible has so many stories of failed relationships with God, you know, the Davids and so forth, who are like, how can you think about these people as men after God's own heart? Um, and yet that gives hope, I think. So Shalom includes that integrity, but also includes that socio-political assessment. And what Randy did was he added two things in his book. Uh, first of all, Shalom is for the community of all creation, not just the human part of that. And actually to refer to something he just said in his book, he says he thinks the word community is a way better word than the word kingdom, which I would completely agree with. The second thing that he does is he says that among the structures of our world is colonialism. Unless we make things explicit, we won't address the problem. So these two inclusions, I think, the, that Shalom is for the community of all creation and among the structure of our world is colonialism and therefore we need to decolonize those structures. And Randy goes further and says, we need to decolonize our minds because our society and our culture is founded on colonial roots, which have epistemic, social, political, and ontological impacts on us. So it goes right to the core of our being. Um, you know, Canada is a settler colonial country. And so all of us who are not indigenous have to come to terms with the fact that colonization has given us privileges and advantages as settlers, even if we didn't directly participate in it or don't come from those European roots. Um, so, you know, Latin Americans have begun to think a lot more about some of these things and have come up with some, some ideas around how do we bring a decolonizing and environmental justice perspective together. Uh, and, and those insights try to understand how the persistence of colonialism colonial values and so forth, sustains the injustices, violence and oppression that we see. And that means recognizing, again, how deeply rooted those values are. Um, and, and I would say to try to get beyond a Eurocentric notion of Christian faith and practice. And again, Randy points that out in, in that book that I've been mentioning. Uh, and I've used that book in classes, uh, both at a university level and in uh, adult Sunday schools. And, um, you know, it's, it's challenging to people because Randy's asking people not just to learn something new, to acquire new knowledge, which is the way we tend to think about knowing in a Western way, but to, to acquire new understandings of God, to rethink our own theologies and our own discipleship. And so these are, these are great challenges that some will rise to, but others will struggle with, but it's a really important thing that we all need to think through, especially as Anabaptists who, who, um, who try, to, try to claim that we're, we're radically following Jesus. We're doing our best to do so. So Randy Woodley, when you hear this account of uh, Anabaptists trying to learn from your theology of Shalom and put these uh, theology of Shalom into conversation and, and this, uh, last comment that um, many Mennonites and churches, uh, many Christian students find your work challenging. I wonder what kind of counsel you would have for Anabaptists as we try to do this work of um, thinking about shalom that includes the whole community of creation, uh, as well as uh, in in includes a real critical examination and praxis around decolonization. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, not only does Randy get my name right, but I think he gets it pretty well right in the article. So 
Uh, I think that's a really good article for people to read and really examine and understand. The only problem I have with it is, I, you know, Dr. Yoder uh, wrote that quite a while ago, and I don't know if that would be his end-all statement of where he ends up. I think he's probably um, moved, uh, uh, probably we're not that far apart. And you, you say that in the article, I think. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, not only not a cradle Mennonite, uh, a term that I've forgotten that you you folks use, but um, I'm I'm not even occasional Mennonite. So, but I I do like to hang with the Mennonites because they've been pretty good to me, and, and a lot of them like to talk about farming, which I like to talk about. So, um, so uh, yeah, I I think um, given the right circumstances, yeah, most people, um, and I like to have times of dialogue. Um, that's that's what I really do uh, to challenge our worldview. So I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, you know, you people are bad people because this happened. What I'm saying is, you know, this happened for a particular reason. It happened because of a particular worldview. And it's very easy, I think, to prove that that worldview is unsustainable. And that world, so, so we like to think that our theologies uh, create our worldview, but it really is just the opposite. Our worldviews create our theologies and, uh, and how we go about understanding that. And so um, the reason I think the Mennonites understand a bit more about Shalom, just uh, besides of the peacekeeping, is because of the connection to the land. And uh, the land is the great teacher. It's the, you know, God has gifted us with uh, creation to be our uh, most continuous and probably best teacher uh, there is the earth herself. So, um, you know, when you have that connection, you, you start to learn stuff, right? And so what I would say is like, you're almost there. Um, it, not that I have all the answers or even any indigenous peoples have all the answers, but there are some things you learn in living in a particular place for, you know, 13 to 28,000 years um, or, or longer. Some would say, well, we were here forever, but, um, but whatever it is, it's a whole lot longer than settler colonialism. And so the land, uh, we're not saying we're experts because we're indigenous. We're saying we're experts on this particular land because our people have lived with it so long and learned from it. And so that's the wisdom that I think that the indigenous people offer the Mennonites and anyone else. And in sort of what I do is I just break down those worldviews and try to compare an indigenous worldview with a Western worldview and show how destructive the Western worldview is and how it will not sustain us in the future on this land. You know, maybe it will somewhere else, I don't know, but it's not going to sustain us in the Americas here. And, uh, and so we, we, we really don't have a choice, but the, the, the choice is that I can choose to look at the biblical record and the stories in scripture and see how they align with, this, with the indigenous ideas. I'm really intrigued by this idea that we learn from the land, uh, not simply we learn about the land, um, but the way you just phrase it. And that's come up in various writings of yours, Randy Woodley. And I'm, uh, I'd be interested to hear both of you reflect some on what it means for Christians to learn not only, again, about the land, but from it. How does land really shape our sense of our calling and mission? And let's... Uh, Let's go to you, Randy, who's at LA uh, first, and then uh, over to Randy Woodley. I mentioned earlier that a lot of times we think of knowledge as something that you acquire um, with the idea then in, in an enlightenment sort of way that um, new knowledge automatically leads to it being used and you know um, it solves the problems if you learn things about whatever the problem is. Um, but there's so much research that shows that that's not the way it happens, that, that new knowledge doesn't impact people. I mean, just look at all the, the evidence for, for vaccines or for climate change or for, um, you know, certain presidents being, you know, okay, we won't go there. Um, so worldviews shape how we think. Uh, worldviews shape how we interpret scripture and how we, we practice our faith and how we live with others. My definition for sustainability is actually uh, living well together in the land. And I like the flexibility of that because it forces us to try to unpack a whole bunch of different stuff in there. What does it mean to live well? Who is the we that is together to be living well? 
Um, and I said, in the land. I didn't say on the land. I said, in the land. So I read the Bible with a sense of deep relationality. And I think it's present there. And one of my early influences in terms of Christian eco-theology, um, Wes Granberg Michelson in the mid 1980s wrote a book called A Worldly Spirituality, where at one point he does a comparison between Hebrew Old Testament and uh, the term Native American worldviews and looking at the relationality that's present in the, in the Old Testament, and that I still find in the New Testament as well. Um, so both sociology and ecology point out that relationality, that we are in this life all together. Um, we humans are in it with all of the rest of creation, not on, on our own. And so we live well together, we have to live it with all the rest of creation as well. And again, the evidence is clear that we're not doing such a good job at that. But again, it's not just all humans, it's particular humans who have the power, who have created industrial cultures, uh, who have separated humans from the rest of creation in, in our thinking and so forth like that. So learning to live from the land means trying to, I'm sorry, learning from the land means trying to, to to figure out what is what does it mean to live well together? Now, what is the good, the flourishing that Shalom represents that would be a flourishing of all the created order, you know, more in line with what, what God seems to desire. And that Bible has, has passages where the mountains and the trees praise their creator and where the rocks cry out when the creator in whom all things hold together went to his death. Um, so again, that, that relationality is, is present right there. Um, it also means, I think, learning from peoples around the world. Uh, global Christianity is very diverse. It has, it, you know, in the seventh century, about 25% of the world's Christians lived in Europe. The rest were scattered across Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. Well, Christianity then collapsed down into Europe. And now we're back to a situation at the beginning of the 21st century where only about 25% of the world's Christians are in uh, Europe. And Africa is the most Christian continent right now, according to a recent uh, article in The Guardian that I just read, um, or The Economist, actually, I might have that wrong. But uh, so learning, learning, we Westerners, we North Americans, learning from the rest of global Christianity and the ways that they see things. So indigenous peoples, Africans with the concept of Ubuntu, uh, Maori peoples. And those aren't just Christians, those are all cultures because if we believe in a one God, creator of all, that means that God has gifted all peoples and all beings with, with something to share with us that we can learn from. And so that's, that's kind of what, what I mean by learning from the land, you know, all the beings in the land, in the land, not on the land. So the land is part of our teaching too. So I mean something similar, uh, and I talk about living with the land um, and being married to the land, right? Uh, Beulah, as the Hebrew scriptures talk about. Um, and, and of course, uh, no one in the scriptures wrote from a post-enlightenment perspective. Um, uh, there might have been some Greek influence here and there, but basically these are people who were largely agrarian and, and during the New Testament switching to a, a sort of urban-centered uh uh, existence, but there's this resistance from that. And so Jesus, he doesn't use a whole lot of stuff about buildings and chariots and crossbows and those kinds of things. He he talks about plain stuff that we see every day, seeds and birds. And, you know, apparently he knows the, the habits of foxes and maybe a particular donkey that he had his eye on and, and fish and, you know, how to catch them. And, you know, all these kinds of things that, that clearly show that he's a person of the land, right? So we, how many sermons do you hear about that? Um, there's so much that people miss, but I, I want to just draw attention. I'm just you know, as you ask that question, like, what can you learn from the land? Like, what can you not learn from the land? The, the podcast people won't be able to see the, the virtual background before me, but it's my backyard two days ago, and it's a sunset. 
you know, as I'm just looking at that sunset, there's so much I can learn just by watching that. You know, my wife and I sort of have this ritual of watching the sunsets and each one is different every night when, when we can see them. The clouds are different, you know, and clouds are this great fractal thing. And there's a whole lot of discussion we could have about fractals and how human beings are really in some ways have a fractal type nature. Um, I see, uh, an oak forest, which was the original, you know, this was an oak savanna. And what happens is that the uh, Doug fir trees come in and try to take over and eventually they do. But we got this property right when uh, the, the oak trees, which I would say are, are akin to the traditions, right? The, the people who've been on the land all this time. And then the firs come in and they let a few in, but when they start to take over, they kill them off, right? Uh, all this happens underground with mycelium and connections and all these, you know, uh, trillions and trillions of micro uh, microbes underneath there. And, and we don't really even understand all that, but what's happened. But eventually, if they just keep coming and no one does anything about it, then uh, the firs take over and there's no more oaks. The oaks die out. Um, you know, there's a lot I can learn from all of this. I look at that sunset and it looks different. And because the earth turns it sets in just a little bit different place every night. You notice it after a couple of days, how it's changing and the sun rises in a different place. And, and, and sometimes I ask my wife what she sees and we see something different looking at the same sunset. And that tells me something about, you know, unity and diversity and, and how every human being and every people have something to contribute that's different than the others and just how big God is. And, you know, like I said, what can't you learn from the land? Thank you. That's a question that I'm going to carry with me for a while. Uh, I want to turn to a, uh, a question from our, one of our listeners. And I just to remind you that uh, if you have a question for either or both of the Randys here, please go ahead and put that in the Q&A box. Um, so this first question comes from Sarah Gurule. Um, who's a student at AMBS here in Elkhart. She says, thank you both for your insights and reflections. As a young theologian who cares deeply about creation, I'm grateful to learn from a great many elders. My question is this, <laughs> what are some, maybe you don't like well, me. He's not referring to me is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> My question is this, what are some ways that a young person can share this rich wisdom with elders who align with a more conservative perspective. Understanding conservative can mean different things, but here in the U.S. Uh, at least uh, there's some general understanding. Someone who would be pretty resistant likely, this is my elaboration on the question, someone who's likely to be pretty resistant, an elder who might um, reject out of hand some of these uh, insights that you're bringing. What would, what would the two of you um, say uh, to, to encourage a, a young uh, person who really appreciates what you're saying, but wants to know how to communicate it with resistant elders. So I think my answer would be real short. I'll go ahead and then Randy, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, uh, you know, take a cue from Jesus. Um, Jesus also talked to his elders, but what he did mostly is he asked them good questions. Um, he understood where he was coming from. He understood it well. You have to understand it well enough to ask good questions that end up leading people to some answers they might be uncomfortable with. And so I would say, you know, uh, it, rather than just challenge them, you sort of subtly challenge them with the questions that you ask. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd make similar kind of comments. Um, I did a lot of workshops on climate change in faith-based communities. And I just moved out of Alberta with which if most people know it's a very oil and gas uh, dependent province um, and kind of doubling down on, on its dependence even further, despite you know both the evidence for climate change, but also the evidence that oil and gas companies are seeing a certain writing on the wall and, and trying to uh, make their own shifts. Um, so in those climate workshops, I often had people who were questioning, resistant, or even outright hostile. Um, and I saw some change over the, the, you know, say last four years or so in doing those workshops as people were getting less 
and less resistant to certain forms of kind of the evidence and so forth. But I didn't rely only on presenting the evidence. You know, the science doesn't convince people. What, what works better is to try to connect our, our values. You know, what do they value that I also value and things like that. And, and sometimes that means asking that question is, what do you value or what kind of world do you want for your children, or even you know, in a couple of decades, you know, where do you think Alberta's economy is going, and how can we we go there with the changes that are happening around the world, um, you know, stuff like that. So what that does is says, hey, we have some common ground, and that's so important. Again, that's a shalom approach. That's a conciliatory or a conciliation sort of approach. Um, and, and going back to topics of indigenous peoples, um, and we, we talk a lot in Canada about reconciliation, but we haven't done very much other than talk. We haven't done a lot of practical work on reconciliation because reconciliation means writing whatever wrongs are there. So um, we also need to, whenever we disagree with other people, try to figure out what kind of wrongs need to be righted and how are we all participating in the wrongs, the systems, the structures? Because, you know, I'm still doing all of the things that add to a changing climate. I'm still relying on the colonial appropriation of indigenous lands for my, my income and stuff like that. So we're all part of this. We're not, so none of us are, um, are completely separate from that. And therefore, if we, if we work to try to figure out what kind of common values we have, you know, people want to be respected by others. People want, nobody, very few people want to do, to do bad or to, um, you know, to continue injustices. So again, those all become ways of saying, okay, well, how can we have more justice for everybody? How can we help Shalom flourish in ways that God desires? Thanks for those responses and we'll take other questions as they come up. But I, I have a question for you kind of coming out of uh, Randy who lives at LA. You just say that, um, you just said that uh, the, the language about reconciliation or even shalom maybe um, and so forth, uh, there's a problem when it remains just at the level of, of talking about it. Um, and there are, uh, efforts within, of course, not only the Anabaptist circles, but including Anabaptist circles. Um, many of these efforts are led by native Mennonites and others, allies, um, to try to get the church to face some of these questions, to really examine the doctrine of discovery, um, the church's historic participation in that, the benefits, you know, uh, short-term benefits it has reaped from uh, participating in that, um, but also, of course, the incredible violence that it has participated in, um, and even for, you know, a community like the Anabaptist community, um, even as we talk about and preach peace. So again, that disjunction between word and deed. And so for those, um, for those folks who are really are trying to engage and are trying to to move from just talking about it. I wonder if you have any words of encouragement or counsel uh, that you could give to them. And here we'll, we'll start with Randy Woodley if you have something you'd like to share. Yeah, a couple things come to mind. Um, in chapter five of my book, Shalom and the Community of Creation, I, I talk about that difference between belief system and actually doing stuff and, and why European peoples are able to um, understand that what they believe is actually what they do. So I don't want to go into all that now, but um, it, it's very much a, a, a endemic to the Western mind that if you have the right knowledge, then that means you know it as opposed to actually doing it. And it's a whole different thing. And, and Jesus taught the latter. He didn't teach knowing cognitively, but cognitively knowing means that you have to embody it. And, um, and that's why so much of our theology is, is uh, disembodied, you know, um, it's, it's a Western problem. So, um, but besides that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I just, 
tell me the crux of the question again. I got lost in my explanation. Uh, sorry, just is... uh, if there's words of encouragement for people who are really trying to engage this work. Yeah. So, um, so we met uh, last year, last July, no, a year ago, July, because it last summer was COVID. Oh my gosh, where's the year gone? Um, so uh, I met with a group of national reconcilers in the United States, um, very famous people who everybody knows. Uh, there were 20 of us and, um, and we were able to talk about some things and we, we made a, a commitment to one another that we would no longer, and it was at my wife's and I's junk, uh, um, uh, encouragement, I would say, um, that they would no longer talk about reconciliation without reparations. Um, because not because like native people need something, but white folks need that healing that it takes to get rid of this stuff and admit it. And then, um, and so my little, I have a little chart that I use and, and it, it goes through sort of four areas and it's a circle and it starts with awareness um, and, it, and it talks about being uh, made aware by cultural guides. And then it talks about lament, which is both a, 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 a pu very public and speaking truth to power about what's been done. And then the idea of reparations and before relationship, because what happens with um, often with uh, settler colonial folks is they build the relationships with indigenous people and then they never feel like they need to do reparations, right? And so, um, and so this reparations is an extremely important part. This is the, the how Zacchaeus receives salvation, right? This is uh, the healing that has to come to white folks as they begin to actually manifest what's happened. And then I talk about memorialization, codifying the markers, recreating uh, physical um, representations of what has actually happened and the healing that happened so that generations down the line can know, hey, this was the problem and this is how our people came together and solved it. And so um, I think what we have to do is just be sure to take this out of the abstract realm and make it real. So um, that's my main encouragement is if you're a young activist and you're a, a person who talks about reconciliation, that you no longer talk about it in an abstract way, but you think like, if I'm going to talk about it, what are we going to do about it? And, and Randy in his, in that book, in that chapter actually is pretty much about the place where the university students that I taught, if they were going to have a problem, they started to really voice it then. Um, because it was what Randy is doing in that book is, is challenging people to change. Um, and at that point, they're not thinking about what they can do to act, but change is an action itself. So to rethink the ways we have always thought things, especially about our faith, about our, uh, our religion, which is the more churchy sociological form of our faith. Um, and even how we practice our faith, you know, those, those are big actions to, to begin to take. Um, but Randy there talks about, um, he makes a comment that about placelessness. So this goes back to the learning from the land. He says that if we are placeless, we will have a hard time embodying shalom. Shalom can't be lived in the abstract. It has to be lived out in, in practices, things that we do and things that we make as shared regularized things. That's what a practice means. So it goes beyond just being an action, but it's something that becomes regular. So Randy, I really like that idea of not talking about reconciliation unless we talk about reparation as well. And I really think that the giving up of things, you know, the giving up of privilege, you know, we talk a lot about the underprivileged or the disadvantaged. Well, that automatically means somebody else has got more advantages and more privileges. And so it really behooves me to ask, how do I give up some of that advantage? How do I give up some of that privilege? Um, yeah. and, and, and that's really fundamental to the, the salvation process in our everyday lives, not ultimate salvation. That's kind of a different thing, but you know, really being faithful to the Jesus way is to share our privileges, our advantages, our gifts, and all that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. so, I guess, I don't know if that answers there, the question. <laughs> Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, let me respond real quick. There's a that that idea of change is a 
there's a biblical word that just actually describes that, but people don't understand it anymore. It's right. called repentance. Ah. Yeah. So, and repentance is what? It's to turn the opposite direction, to say that everything I've entangled myself in and all the systems and structures going this way, which were wrong, I need to turn around and go the opposite and entangle myself in those systems that, that move towards shalom and move towards good. And one of those ways is reparations. And the, and the scripture is very clear about it. There is no doubt scripturally that reparations is part of our lifestyle as Christian people, as people who follow Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to right the wrongs. You can't just think the writing, you have to do the writing. We've got a couple more minutes and we've got a couple questions up. So I'm gonna uh, get into these here. Uh, we may not have time for all the questions, but I do invite uh, people to keep asking. So the first is uh, from Justin Isinga, who identifies himself as a graduate student in theology at Canadian Mennonite University researching land-based learning. And he notes that Randy holds a delay. You talked about giving land back as a practice that institutions can take as they learn to live in shalom. And I and Justin here asks, do either of you have any practical steps that any institutions can take in this regard? Are there examples of how land can be returned with reciprocity and strong relationship at the center? Wow. How long do we have? We just have a couple minutes. So uh, if there's any kind of at least even uh, just directing Justin and other listeners to some resources, uh, but any any thoughts that you would want to share at this point. Randy? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, there's, there's uh, in, in especially some of the mainline churches, you got churches closing all over the place and people selling their buildings. And, and to me, the first thing that they should think of is justice to the people whose stolen land that they are on, right? But in the Mennonite, uh, maybe not so many uh, churches like that, there's a lot, there's, there's really many, many, a myriad of ways that people can create uh, land returns and land uses and access to sacred land and uh, places for homes and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but those, there's no one prescription, I don't think, that says A, B, C, D. You have to work those things out on the journey toward uh, reparations and reconciliation. So um, that's the main thing is to find cultural guides that can help you walk through the, the process. In this final question, I'll t- there's two questions, but they, they point in the same direction uh, from Darren Dirksen and James Crable. They note uh, the urban character of many Mennonites and other Anabaptists today. And as James says, uh, the vast majority of global Anabaptists today live outside of the uh, Euro North American context, and mo- many, if not most, are in urban settings. So, how do you articulate the good news of shalom to people in Jakarta or Kinshasa, or I'll say here in Elkhart, Indiana, who are cut off from the land and, <laughs> as James puts it, cannot remember the last time they saw a beautiful sunset on the horizon? Okay, but but people aren't cut off from the land because they always live somewhere. So they always live in a place. We don't again. We don't live in the abstract. We live somewhere. So figuring out what's going on there. What's, what's the deal with the ecologies of Jakarta, both the social ecologies and the natural ecologies and the way those all interact. I mean, Jakarta, if I remember right, is, is, is either sinking or the sea is rising, or maybe there's a combination of both as the water percolates into the underlying ground. So it's the capital of Indonesia and it's about to move um, because the city is sinking into the ocean. Um, so that's just an example. I actually wrote an article years and years ago, but it's still online, um, called Remystifying the City. To find wonder in the city and to recognize that, you know, the natural world and our, our fellow beings still exist in the city, maybe not in the same ways, but they still are there. I mean, you get great, great sunsets when there's polluted air. Um, so there's so many things to do with urban-based environmental education. And, and again, if we take this combined socio-ecological approach, then there's so much to do even in urban environments. So yeah, I just I reacted really strongly, I guess, to that question. So um, I, I think 
uh, again, there's a lot of creativity that can go into this and there's a lot of people models that are actually occurring. But I have to say I was in Elkhart, um, you know, a couple of years ago for the, the Rooted Conference and uh, I, I have a hard time comparing it with Jakarta and Kinshasa, you know, Kinshasa. But, um, but anyway, you know, to each their own. But in Elkhart, you have the Mary Lee Center out there. If you need to get out there and connect, you know, uh, that, that's one way to do it. You have um, uh, uh, cities only take up so much space. Um, we, build, we need to rebuild our cities differently. Um, this is something that's one of the most important things that we can begin to do. And I always talk to young people about, you know, getting on your city council, uh, be a city planner, being a city attorney, you know, um, you know, get in a place for a mayor of your city so that you can make decisions to rebuild your city in a different way, in a sustainable way. And, and you can do sustainable cities. One of the examples, of course, that people always use is down in uh, Brazil, um, uh, oh, the name of the place. I'm, I'm, it's slipping my mind right now. But, um, uh, but there, there are models all over the place. Um, there are people who do what they call guerrilla gardening in cities. Um, and uh, of course, all the cooperatives and rooftop stuff. And so you have to get creative and there has to be work and you have to use empty city lots, but you can build community and you can build um, uh, healthy, um, kind of get rid of food deserts and and, and build healthy living situations and, and start to move towards more shalom in cities, although it does seem more difficult at first, but people uh, in cities tend to, be, tend to be really creative anyway. So um, there are ways to do it. Since you, you both answered that question passionately yet concisely, <laughs> I'm gonna ask this last question from Laura Rhodes. Um, and she's saying, uh, in thinking about learning to live with the land in sustainable and rooted ways, and embody shalom. Do you have any thoughts for those of us who have a strong desire, or even seem to feel the spirit calling, to leave our homeland and participate in a culture and land far from our own? I'm thinking especially about the ecological ramifications of such travel, like with visits back to see home family, as well as the colonialism privilege that seems to be inevitably embedded in white folks taking opportunities to go live in majority uh, world countries. So this is a question about mission and shalom. Um, cross-cultural or intercultural mission and shalom. What would you uh, have to say to that question? Um, you can learn from other cultures and it's probably a good thing. You can also learn from the experiences of other people who have traveled or lived elsewhere or people who have traveled to us. We often see they're immigrants. Um, you know, I mean, a big thing to do is to see that there are many ways of being human and many ways of sharing and many different forms of economics or politics or living with the land and, and so forth. So uh, these can be good things. They also may not be that necessary because you can do that all that kind of work where you live. Uh, so that might be mission also. And maybe even more important mission since the global north really uses the vast majority of the world's resources, even though we're a much smaller part of the population. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, if you have a virus, uh, stay home. <laughs> and if that virus is the Western worldview and you're still working your way through uh, decolonizing and all of that, it's better not to spread that virus to other people. Um, but there comes a point when um, you probably with enough humility uh, can get out and begin to actually do some good uh, if you're ready to learn from others as much as you are to teach others and serve uh, as much as you are to um, sort of take the pleasures of, uh, and then I don't know if we're talking about short-term mission or long-term mission, but you know, there's, there, are, there are things that need to be done and there's empowerment that needs to be made but it, it, we really need to stop doing it from this sort of uh, Western hegemonic um, worldview. So, yeah. uh, This has been a really rich conversation and I agree with Steve, Steve Heinrichs who puts in the chat, if the two Randys ever co-teach a course, I'm signing up. This has been super helpful. <laughs> uh, I agree, I've been taking notes. Uh, there's just a lot that you have offered that I think we could talk about for hours and. Uh, I'm really grateful for the, to the two of you. So thank you so much for joining us here.
Yeah, Thank as you. am I. I. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Randy, for your wisdom and insight. Well, thank you for giving me excellent material to work with students with. Uh, so that is all the time we have for today. We will be posting the recording of this interview. Um, it'll be up on YouTube, uh, so you'll be able to watch it later, share with your friends. You can find that on our Anabaptist Witness social media accounts, as well as on the events tab of our website. Um, so please do share it. Um, if you're interested in Anabaptist Witness, again, check out our social media. We've got Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts in our website, www.anabaptistwitness.org. And that's where you'll find Randy Halusa Delay's article and the earlier interview with Randy Woodley that I mentioned before. Uh, Anabaptist Witness is a project of Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, Mennonite Central Committee, Mennonite Church Canada, and Mennonite Mission Network. And uh, so thanks to those supporting institutions and a special thanks to my assistant, Marcos Acosta, without whom we would not be able to do this. He's the one who's handling the publicity, all the social media and all the technical aspects of pulling off this webinar. And in fact, if you're interested in learning more about Marcos, which I hope you are, you can uh, hear him in conversation in our next webinar on March 11th with his father, Luisa Costa. And they'll be actually talking uh, with Linda Shelley from Mennonite Mission Network about work that uh, Luisa Costa, Linda Shelley, and others were a part of in the Argentine Chaco, accompanying a, an indigenous V community in uh, land buyback. Uh, mm -hmm. So this will be of interest to, uh, to many here. Its interview will be in Spanish. So uh, if you speak Spanish or want to test your Spanish abilities, this will be a great chance um, to join in and participate in uh, in our webinar series. I uh, will have our final uh, webinar series, uh, webinar for this initial series in April, on April the 8th, I believe, um, with uh, the guest editors of our worship issue, um, Katie Graber and Annalie Leptisen. And so uh, that'll be in English. Um, so if you are looking for another English language opportunity to connect, uh, please do so then. Again, thanks to Randy and Randy and to all of you for being here. Um, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, everybody.